I'm Neil Kummer. I started this business back when I was 24, 25. And uh, now I'm 26. No, I'm just kidding. That's my first joke. And I started a year after I made Aliyah, and that was uh, in 1978. And uh, for the first 15 years, it was mostly appliances because appliances were a big deal because taxes were over 200%. And then they, over the years, they gradually reduced them. So, uh, and now they're, and for the last 25 years or so, they've been at about 17% if you bring them in from the country of origin. But you folks, if you were assuming you were uh, Olim or returning residents or Katin Chosrim, people who grew up in Israel and then moved and came back, uh, you, have no, you have no taxes at all. And you can also bring things from other countries. So, uh, so we started then uh, bringing relocations. In other words, packing up people's houses and, and shipping them door to door. So that's what we've been doing ever since. And uh, I think we're improving with time, luck. You know, we've gotten lucky. They say, you know, that if you try long enough, you eventually get lucky with, with who, your, who your agents are and stuff like that. So uh, those, are, those are the kind of luck we had. We have, so the, I'll just tell you, the choices, like in terms of who you're going to be using for a shipment, if you decide to make a shipment, and I'll, we'll go through that as well, as to, you know, some people decide not that it's simply not something they want to do. They don't, they don't love any of their furniture and they don't have anything they value in America or wherever they're coming from. So they bring nothing. That's, I don't think that's so typical. I mean, that's what I did when I was uh, 24. I brought my stereo and my bicycle, but that was, you know, I was a different stage of life. So people who have stuff that they really like or that they things that they'd really like to have and it's cheaper to buy in America, which is nearly everything. Those then you probably make a shipment. And some people ship a lot of stuff. Uh, and some people ship not so much stuff. Some people fill containers of these things, like multiple containers, and some people ship one. This is a thousand foot container. Some people ship two thirds full of a container. Uh, there's infinite variety. The, some people ship one of these things or several of these things, which are called LCL, less than container loads. And uh, we'll go through all the reasons why you might choose one over the other and what's worth bringing and what's worth leaving, uh, what, what the differences are in terms of timing and in terms of uh, surprises, possible surprises, how to avoid them. And uh, if you want, we'll even give tips on Aliyah, uh, like how to succeed, you know, how to culturally insulate yourself, stuff like No, Usually I don't talk about that, but someday, maybe we're going to start doing a podcast and we'll start interviewing Olim who've done interesting things and we'll, and we'll, um, and we'll ask them questions like that. But for now, we're just going to focus on shipping. So shipping is usually done in these kinds of big, metal boxes, which are called uh, shipping containers, and they're owned by the shipping companies. So which, what we do on your behalf is rent them, uh, either one or more or half, or we just, or we have what's called consolidators in various places who will put together a bunch of these smaller shipments, uh, like a few of these or one of these, and put them into a container together, and that's called a less than container load. Um, and that's obviously a lot cheaper, but it's a lot more expensive per cubic foot. So th the more you ship, the cheaper the rate is per cubic foot. There are also advantages um, in terms of uh, timing, like for these container loads, where what happens is they pack up your stuff, they come to your house, they pack up your stuff, and then they they usually come the same day with a container like this. and and then load it in and then lock it and seal it and take it away, take it to the port, it goes onto a boat. Uh, if it's a direct sailing, it just takes from the East Coast just like 22 days. Uh, if it's sometimes the people put them on indirect sailings, which can get stuck in Greece for a month. So th these are the different sizes of containers. And um, uh, let's, let's try to go so that I don't just float around to different subjects. I'm going to try to follow the pattern of this, uh, of this presentation, uh, of this PowerPoint. 
So the best solution for your move. So clearly the first thing to do is decide that you're really making Aliyah and to see if you really want to bring your goods. And we'll, we'll get to the idea of like, what do you really like enough to bring? And one of the answers I have right away is if you like it well enough to bring, then don't bother spending money and storing it in America. We've had a couple of people in the last few years who said, well, we'll store the stuff and we'll see how the kids like living in Israel. It's like, no, no, no. you have to be like, it's like if you did marriages like that, they, most marriages wouldn't work out or, you know, because it's like, what do they say? Um, in Grey's Anatomy, it's ham or bacon, ham or, ham or eggs. Like the eggs are the chicken and they're like not fully committed, but the ham, he's fully committed. So yeah, I guess it's worthwhile trying to at least uh, attempting to really come and make a commitment. I didn't do it that way. I just like came and lived day by, you know, one day, one week, turned into a month, into a year, and then another day. Another... Anyways, this is not an inspirational talk or, or the opposite of that. So I'm just going to jump right into the details and later I'll get to maybe something a little bit fuzzier about Aliyah. So the non-fuzzy details of Aliyah shipping are that you, if you folks are returning residents, that is people who are out of the country, who are Israelis or made Aliyah at one time and then went back and you stayed out for at least two years, then you have rights for nine months to bring in two shipments. If you're Olim, or returning minors, people who grew up here and then left and came back, then you have three shipments in three years. And that means it doesn't just mean no VAT, no sales tax. No, it also means no sales tax or no customs. So it, it's could total, it usually totals about 30%. I just made a shipment from Amazon because I'm not supposed to hitchhike on my customer shipments. So I made a shipment from Amazon, actually via one of those, when some consolidator, and they charged, uh, the stuff costs like $700 was all sorts of miscellaneous things that I couldn't find here. And, uh, and the taxes were like $250. So that's what you're saving is you're saving all the taxes. So if you have $10,000 worth of stuff, you're saving 3,000. If you're saving, you have a hundred thousand, you're saving $30,000 in tax. So it's no, how do you say it? No means some. It's a significant amount that you can save uh, over over bringing stuff in and paying taxes. But you only have three years and only three shipments. And you can bring them from any country. So if you wanted to bring in a bunch of Italian furniture or German appliances or whatever, you could bring them from Europe. Things that you, you're supposedly, like all the things that, that I'm saying about Olim are... I think that there's a bit of a change here. Uh, what do they call it? A sea change in the attitude at customs to Olim, such that they're really being nice to us. I mean, us. I made Aliyah 44 years ago, but they're being nice to our customers also. So we had a guy who packed up his own, like a whole houseful full of tiles and sinks and plumbing supplies and who knows how many appliances and multiples of computers and TVs. And they charged him not a penny or a shekel of taxes. Like that's unheard of. So, uh, and they rarely uh, inspect people. We had another customer who brought in like a, a, a zillion dollars worth of, you know, like two containers full of every everything you can imagine that's expensive. And they didn't like, they just didn't blink an eye. They just said, fine. One of, we had another customer who was absolutely determined to declare things at their very fullest and you know, value because he didn't want to have any uh, besmirches, uh, whatever is karma or is me dope. So he, um, she, I don't know, I think it was a she. So it was a tiny little shipment, like 70 cubic feet, like equivalent to like, a small box of this or two of these pallets. So not a lot of stuff. And, but it was worth like, she'd paid like $5,000 for it. I don't know what it was, but, and she insisted on declaring it for $5,000. And this being a, a formerly uh, socialist country in a country where 90% of the people still are not earning amazing salaries. They thought that was peculiar that, you know, maybe it's one thing to bring in $5,000 in a tiny little shipment 
and it's another thing to declare it. So that's like un, you know, a little bit uncalled for. So they inspected her shipment and found out there was nothing wrong with it. But just to say that you have to play the game of what I what I call um, minimal reasonable value. That's what you declare stuff for. And we make up a part of our preparation for going through customs is we make up a declaration for you based on your packing list. And and then you can revise it, review it, and declare things in any other way you feel you feel is fit. Israelis, regular Israelis, if they make a shipment, or even this is something new. They're just like they're becoming especially nice to Olim. They're be becoming especially difficult with Israelis who don't live here anymore. Like if let's say some Israeli went to Panama and became rich, and then wanted to import uh, a bunch of Italian furniture for his villa in Caesarea. So he said, well, I'm a returning resident, right? And they said, no, you don't live here. And you're not, you know, you haven't, you haven't even been here for four months. Uh, so we're not going to give you that status. So they're a little bit prejudiced. They used to be difficult with returning uh, Israelis, uh, but now they're just selective about who they'll let take that status. So it's kind of um, interesting. Um, so similarly, tourists and students uh, don't have any special rights except for cars. A student, uh, someone who's registered full-time at a institute of higher learning can bring in any car, pretty much, uh, and pay zero taxes as opposed to Israelis who pay on most taxes 125%. Uh, so that's a big, amazing discount, but the deal is that they have to uh, take it out as soon as they uh, stop being a student. So we've had some people who said, oh, yeah, we registered as a, we're full-time at some yeshiva, you know, and the guy brought in like a, whatever, he brought in a fancy car and uh, paid zero taxes, and he stayed a student for, I don't know, I guess many years. But in for usual things like non if it's not a if it's a hybrid then everybody's paying the same 75 percent 80 percent if it's electric if the taxes are down around 20 or 40 and the and the uh and the ole is probably going to get a discount of like 10 percent or something because the taxes are already so low and the special deal that the that um that olim have is that they can bring a car that's older so and depreciation is very high and quick so so somebody could bring in a car that's let's say five years old and it will have depreciated by like 60 percent so they're paying it they're paying 75 percent assuming it's a, or if it's electric 40 percent or a hybrid 40 no 75 uh not a hybrid but electric whatever i'm 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 not so up on the on the current tax things for these cars but daniel is who works with us so anyways the, the deal is that why is it a, such a great deal? Because they could bring in a car that's six years old or five years old and it'd be depreciated by 60%, according to the Blue Book, and pay uh, very little taxes. As, and it can be as old as you want it as long as it has the latest versions of uh, safety things, like uh, what they call ESP, which stands for something or other, uh, like some sort of uh, braking system. And... And that's it. And to Shav Chozer, their special privilege, they pay full taxes, just like any Israeli. And their special privilege is they can bring a car that's two years older than a regular Israeli, which is also, it's like, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but that's two years of depreciation. So the taxes would go, to, go down by at least 20% or so. So it is a pretty deal, but it's nothing compared to what an Ole can bring in. And why would, a, uh, why would an Ole bring in a car at all? if they can buy a tax-reduced uh, car here uh, for a few reasons. One is if there's like a Toyota Sienna, like a van, a good Japanese van that isn't available here, where it's very pricey and you already own one, and the kids can only fall asleep in that car, or your father gave it to you, whatever, you know, things like that. Or if you just think it's a good value, and you can, we can help you compare the cost of buying a car locally with with bringing one in. In some cases, it's no big deal. In some cases, it's a significant savings, okay? So that's about vehicles. 
and it's it, it's it's a kind of a big deal. Like we, the costs are like six thousand dollars just to ship it over and clear it through all the different procedures and inspections and safety this and clearing that and which some we had one French guy who actually did most of that himself, which we were very impressed by. But most people wouldn't think of it. And uh, it used to take like months to clear a car. Now we do it just like clearing anything else, like in a week or two. But that's why it costs as much as it does. So let me talk about for a moment about what you might want to bring before we talk about what the prices are and how prices are determined and things like that. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'll answer that question in a moment. So what, what, why would you want to bring anything? So most things, and we have a chart that's that we made up based on our research over the years about what things and things change of course but what things how much more things cost than they here than they do in, in america and the usual figure is about two and a quarter times american appliances it can be over three uh of course of course uh, like art could be one and a half times and divrei kodesh could be just like none one you know no no difference or even probably less for some Sifri Kodesh. So, and there are also some things that it's simply not worthwhile bringing if you wanted to bring European appliances. There's no point in going to Bondi, um, who's a great guy, uh, Avi at Bondi, but there's no point in buying your plane prices from him and then paying for shipping and paying for service country when you can get the same thing here for probably less money. But there are some appliances that are still worthwhile bringing. Uh, there are even some appliances that are worthwhile buying if you if you're if you're enamored of of American uh, washer dryers, which are much bigger and faster and uh, don't use heat to wash, use uh, agitation uh, compared to the European dryer and washer. So th that's the speed queen. But if you own these other things, like an electric oven or a big fancy fridge, whatever a sub, you know, whatever the fancy fridges are, or one that you really like, you can bring it and use it on a transformer, uh, a big mixer, a KitchenAid. We use the, our all two, two of these, and we've used a, mix, a Vitamix type thing also on a transformer, and they work just fine. And they don't buzz if you get a good transformer. And nowadays, you can buy from Amazon a great 2,000-watt transformer, which is more than you need for any of these things, probably, for like $100. So uh, it's, it's worthwhile if you own these things already. And as far as furniture, also furniture, as I said, is usually like two and a quarter times more. Artwork, all this stuff is mainly stuff that's either you want to buy it and bring it because it's high quality, uh, and it's going to last, and you're going to only have rights once. And because the range and uh, price, you know, pricing, uh, uh, a range of choices and pricing is so much better in America than here. So you'll choose things that you really like or things that you already own and you really like. Of course, you do not want to bring things that you don't like. Don't bring things you hate. You know, <laughs> we once had a guy who uh, he, he said, he didn't want to pay like his full bill because I don't know how much of this I can or should tell. But basically, he said, I just shipped a, bu shipped a bunch of junk over. Like, why should I have to pay for all this volume? It's like, well, you know, you shipped it over. It's like, we didn't ship it over. Like, you decided to ship it. Anyways, bottom line is if you don't really like stuff and, or you don't really care or you're happy with used stuff because there's some great sites where you can get where people just give stuff away and – we have our we have some lo friends locally who are you know who uh, shopped a lot in what's that place called in America where you can get secondhand clothes and they have some really fancy secondhand clothes places here and they have um you know people just leave stuff on the street anyways that's if you want to you know uh do the kind of the hippie thing or something and just get stuff that's available here uh f you know secondhand there's stuff available but if you stuff if you like new stuff and or if you have stuff you like, so obviously it's worthwhile bringing, uh, and it's not worthwhile storing stuff in America and deciding if you know because if it's if you like it well enough to, to to store it, it's probably worthwhile bringing it, unless you really don't, you know, it could be like my sister who got as far at one of my sisters, who got as far as uh, the Ali Ashaliyah, who told her. This was probably in the early 70s. Says, wait, you want to leave the valley in, in in L.A. and move to Israel? Like, are you crazy? And she said, oh, 
And so, so she went home. So if that's your level of resolve about making Aliyah, then it probably is worthwhile storing your stuff and just, you know, coming. Or better yet, just come on a tourist visa and whatever. So it, it requires a certain amount of resolve and a certain amount of discipline to uh, come to Israel, as you all, are, all know, and and to stay. And if you have a certain a, a certain amount of that, it's probably worthwhile bringing things you really like because that'll help you feel like uh, feel at home more quickly. The other secret to feeling at home, of course, is to find a community. Unless you're like absolutely nuts or in a good way possibly and you know you you were um you you coming as a lone soldier or something and you're just jumping right in then it's the, the the secret to aliyah at least my secret to aliyah and is um insulating yourself and moving to a community of similar types of people just like israelis when they move to america tend to move to uh and, and befriend a lot of other uh, Israelis. So it sounds a little bit whatever, but it's it's uh, that's really the way it is. I mean, that's the way it is for me. So in terms of when to start the process, so you chose the right time, which is now. Uh, whenever you can start thinking about it, the more you think about it, probably the more you'll educate yourself and the more you'll you'll help you'll help yourself to decide. Like the basic part of this is uh, maybe you've gotten that point is deciding uh, what you want to bring. A lot of people say, well, I'll decide according to how much it costs to ship. So yeah, but it, even if you don't yet know how much it's going to cost, what you can do is make a couple of lists up. I'm just going to make, make a note about creating a slide about that, about having mul multiple lists, like an A list and a B list. So that you can say, these are the things I absolutely want to take. These are the things I absolutely do not want to take. And these are the things that I may want to take if there's room or if the price is right. So then when the guy comes out or does a video call to you to see what kind of volume you have, then he can give you, or actually he doesn't give you, all he does is estimate volume. And that's another thing that we'll talk about is, uh, what to what to communicate to our agents about and what not to communicate to them about. So he's not going to be able to tell you about pricing. He's going to be able to tell you about volume, and that's it, nothing else. And you shouldn't actually listen to him about anything else. And that's one of the things we warn people against. It's even written in our contra in our tiny little contract of five lines, which is don't listen to what the movers say about anything except. Nothing. Don't listen to them about anything. If they say, oh, it'll fit, no. You well have planned that already. You've made an A list and a B list, and you already got a volume estimate. And you hope that it's pretty accurate because your goods were organized and your lists were organized, and maybe you've even segregated stuff in your house. So, um, And so you're not going to listen to these guys who are going to try to tell you, oh, you have a whole container, and you can fill it up as much as you want, and it's not going to cost you a penny more. No, probably not. Because we we do sometimes send uh, sign contracts with people for a full container, but a lot, plenty of times also, especially if they're shipping the bigger container, they can opt to ship a, a two thirds full container, which is cheaper than shipping a, a smaller container and overflow. So it's actually a a good option. But if the, if you were to ship more than the estimated minimum then you would pay some incremental amount for each cubic foot for each additional volume and but it would be much cheaper than the than the pro rata than the like if you divided it by the number of cubic feet you already had so so in any case you don't listen to the truckers about that you don't listen to them about what rights you have they don't know they don't have a clue but that won't stop some people from giving you advice and there are, there's some good jokes about that, but I can't remember any of them right now. But the other thing is uh, you don't want to listen to the rights. You don't want to listen to them about what what's worth bringing. Some people say like, oh, yeah, bring your wine collection. But like, no, like it can get pretty hot in the container. So you really don't want to bring your wine collection in the container. You could bring whiskey, uh, a reasonable amount of whiskey, but uh, you don't want to bring your wine. Unless you, I don't know, if it's mivushal enough, maybe it wouldn't make a difference if we're heated again. I hadn't thought of that. So if you're Chabad, you can bring your wine. So we talked about rights. And uh, so how does the guy, the volume estimator, how does he figure out? Because it's tricky. 
because not only are there three dimensions to each item, uh, you know, height, width, and depth, but there's how these things fit together. Like if you stick them into a box like this and they're of different shapes, can you imagine that it's not going to be so easy to maximize the, the use of the space if there's a bunch of differently shaped items. Whereas if you ship a big amount of stuff and they put it into one of these things so they can play around until you know they've really gotten efficient packing and and whatever extra space they've left they may have left it intentionally to like sometimes they when they build a wall of boxes they can actually fill some boxes just with packing materials in order to support the rest of the boxes if they don't have the right number of right number of boxes so sometimes an empty space is usually a direct correlation with how well things arrive like if stuff if things are crowded together and you know, there's no space left or you stuck a bunch of i don't know heavy things in your in your china closet so you know things could get damaged more or also if there's like twisting and turning on the high oceans on the high seas then the the container or the um the what's it called the uh, china class could china closet could be kind of like torn apart if it has all these heavy things in it so just to go back to the how do they determine the the the, the volume of stuff because it's also how it's going to fit together and it's also the size overall of the shipment because if it's a small shipment it's going to be harder to and they're irregularly shaped items it's going to be harder to maximize the space use and also when you ship something like this you're also paying for this outer skeleton or the under skeleton and, and it's covered over with plastic so so that takes up space so there's there's three ways in which in which the bigger the shipment uh the lower the rate per per volume one is because the rate is is simply lower per volume the bigger the shipment the other is because it's easier to efficiently pack when it's a bigger area and the other is you're not paying for that crating unless it's a delicate item or uh, the palletizing with the plastic over it, which can take up also space. So those are ways in which a bigger shipment is cheaper per, uh, per volume. In some places in the Midwest, there are agents of ours who use weight, like per hundred pound. And that's a lot easier to estimate. Uh, your stuff can be less organized for them to get an accurate estimate because things the weight doesn't change by how much you put in, how you put it in, how you load it. You know, if you load heavy things on top of light things, it's not going to change the weight of anything. So that doesn't really matter. So that's easier. So, but there are things and we, we list them uh, of how to avoid and what kind of things, uh, how to avoid mistakes in volume estimates and how to, in, and if you want to, there's also guaranteed ways of, uh, of having mistakes. One of them is to have one spouse do the volume estimating part with the agent and the other one do the picking up part and not having them talk to each other. That's, that's guaranteed mistakes. Or if your stuff is just like we had one customer, I think about six months ago, the guy came to his house and everything was just in piles. And he said, I'm taking a third of that pile and two thirds of that pile and a quarter. So that was guaranteed. So they just left and said, organize your stuff better. And uh, they came back another day. Okay, so that's how, um, how volume and weight, that's how uh, prices, that's like basically the structure and the, the, that's the raw material of your quote. And, and we'll talk later about how to avoid any surprises. Actually, I'll cheat and tell you right now. Um, the, the some of, what are the surprises? The surprises are mostly uh, relate to containers, uh, because containers are big things. They're like twenty feet long, forty feet long, and they can be uh, eight or seven feet high and seven feet wide. So if you have like an, a tree, if you have a overhung, that doesn't sound right. It's trees that've been drinking and they're overhanging the streets. You. you um, then you probably can't get the container through there. Or if you have like in the old, you're going to move to the old city or to the German colony or to some of the chic uh, places in Tel Aviv where the streets are like this wide. So, or you're moving to the center of Tel Aviv and there's no parking anytime, let alone uh, the possibility of you're saving three spaces for a big truck. 
So you might have to pay for a shuttle, which means transferring your stuff from the container to a smaller truck, sometimes a really small truck, sometimes a rickshaw. No, I'm just kidding. And um, and that's there's an extra charge for that. There's also extra if they can't, like say you can't find parking and they have to carry the stuff more than 25 meters, that could be an extra charge as well. Uh, and all this stuff, the earlier we know about it, uh, the more likely we can, uh, we'll quote it or, you know, right away. And so it won't be a surprise anymore. I know you like surprises, but not those kinds of surprises. So other things that can, that can incur additional charges, if you have like a really old elevator, like we're delivering someplace, this it just happened, whatever I went, I don't usually go to deliveries to scout out the, the place, but this was a special customer and whatever. And so I went and they said, like, don't use the elevator, even for people. Like, and this was like a fancy building in a nice neighborhood. Don't use the elevator. So we, so there's an elevator, but don't use it. So, and there are places with, you know, with little old elevators that you could use for a person. But if you used it like 20 times in a row to bring up most of your shipment, that would, you know, be it's uh, the end of it. So, um, so in, as an alternative to those things, uh, solution is a crane, and they have trains are now much less expensive than they used to be. They used to only have these arm cranes that you know could uh, go over tall buildings uh, and um, put things right, you know, precisely into a balcony or into a window. And now they have cheaper things which look like firemen's crane, firemen's ladders, and they have a big platform in the end. You just load the stuff on and lift it up, load it on, lift it up, and it's really cheap. I mean, it's like less than $100 an hour or something close to that, uh, which is really cheap. Uh, okay, let me answer a couple of the questions because I think some of them related to customs. Uh, how do I qualify from tax benefits if my shipment leaves the USA before I arrive in Israel? So that's not a problem. The, the issue is, and it did come up as an issue with, during COVID because they were giving a hard time to even to a lean to come in. Nowadays, they've, they've, uh, they've, they stopped doing that. And uh, so, so the deal is that you have to be in the country when you're clearing your shipment, but you don't have to be in the country in Israel when you're clearing your, sh when your, when your shipment is shipped. In other words, if let's say this, the, the vessel takes from your door to, uh, the port here, it takes, uh, I don't know, four weeks, let's say, so for a container. Excuse me. And um, so you just have to be in the country at the end of that four weeks when the shipment arrives. You don't have to be, or when you want to clear it, you could even come two days after it arrives and then you can clear it. But we recommend coming like a week or so before the shipment arrives and you get, you know, uh, you get to, you know, meditate in a Zen empty apartment for a a little a little while and then and then your shipment comes in and you say whatever but that you only have to be in the country in this country in order to receive your shipment to clear your shipment you don't have to be in israel when your shipment is shipped out yeah brand new oven with shabbat mode yes you can absolutely do that if it's a gas oven you should check with us whatever the oven is you should probably check with us because there's a way even with an electric oven uh there's a way to split it uh so that you have instead of like American electric ovens are 240, but they're wired as two times 120. So what they do is uh, is they somehow combine it and they make it one times 220, one times 240, and that works. And for gas ovens, there's both a little transformer uh, for the uh, for the electric part of it, and there's a uh, conversion kit for the gas part of the oven. But it's worth checking out because if you're depending on the Shabbos mode, um, you think, uh, whatever, I'm not going to give you a, um, a well-considered answer. But I would say like this, some of the ovens, uh, and even some, I mean, in the old days when we were doing a lot of appliances, uh, we even called up like the engineering department at General Electric. And we say, we've heard that your clocks, which control the timer for the oven as well, are 50, 60 hertz. And the uh, engineer kind of said like, really? We, we didn't know that. So anyway, so you, you gotta you gotta check it with, with probably with, there's a company called Kedar who was like in business before we were in business. So that means they've been in business for like at least 45 years or so. 
and and they would know like by experience which which ones work fine and which ones can be easily converted yeah so that question so that's possible surprises other possible surprises storage um, full containers get two to four days at port and less than container loads get 28 days free at the port and um, containers become expensive pretty quickly because they're you're paying also remember i said at the very beginning that you're renting the container you're not owning it so you're paying rental on the container after the first week plus you're paying storage at the port so that's not something you would want to do if you're in the country and you're there's any possible way to do it even leaving a deposit is something we've done in the past we could if you even if you weren't in the country we would clear your shipment and put bring it out to a private storage and uh, that would be saving you a bunch of money right away and if if we could if it, if it was already cleared then we could simply transfer it to a storage container uh, out of the port and then you're saving both the rental of the container and you're saving the storage at um, uh, okay I'll send you if you if uh, tomorrow if you send me uh, an email after I'll try to remember but I'll give you my email at the end and you can, I'll tell you right now, it's, it's, or just go to our website and fill in a form and you can ask uh, on the form, you can ask for uh, the contact information. I think I even remember it, 923-4295, 03923-4295, whatever. Ask me again, that's probably the right number because I used it for so many years, but don't depend on it. Yeah, so send us an email or fill in a contact form on our website. Okay. Other things, security inspections, this is actually out of date because LA has been, uh, you know, karmically erased from the, from the, by the chain, what's it called, supply chain, because LA got so backed up or is so backed up with, they were showing pictures on the news of like 40 container ships, each of them holding 5,000 containers, uh, just waiting outside of the port to get in. And because they got so overwhelmed by this, they stopped uh, harassing our customers, the people who were shipping stuff out of LA. Until that time, for the last, you know, 10 years, they've been doing security inspections for no reason at all, completely unjustified, just a way to extract money. And it was expensive, it was like 1000 to $4,000, and it, they never found anything. It was, I'm sure it was some sort of mafia nonsense. And uh, so now they're getting payback, and they, we even when we're shipping somebody out of LA, we can't. We simply have to, we have to pack them up in LA and truck them up to Oakland. And and so, anyways, so there's karma that even extends to cities, right? So uh, and also other surprises that won't be surprises if you tell us about them early. And we have questions in our, we have little sets of questions that we send out at various times to try to get quest get information out of you. That doesn't sound good either, <laughs> but like a big safe or a sub zero that weighs 400 pounds or 50 boxes of books, those could incur a surcharge. But if we know about it earlier, then it won't be a surprise. Okay, other things. So we talked about the different kinds of shipments. I'll just explain the dynamic of how this works, uh, a shared container. So uh, why is a shared container slower and less predictable than, a, than an exclusive container? because it's shared with a bunch of other people. So if you share it with just one other person, so that's perfectly legitimate, and you don't, the customs made a new rule that you don't even have to empty it out of the port. You can just clear through customs and deliver both of them. Whereas if you ship more than two, you by law have to empty it. So there, one of our competitors has a bit, I, I consider it to be a trick, it's maybe just call it poor judgment. They charge really cheap prices per cubic foot. And why? How? Because they take really big shipments that should normally be sent in their own containers and they put them in a big container and then they fill in the rest with a bunch of other people's things. Now, what does that mean? Since these the goods in the container are packed as if they were going to be in an exclusive container, meaning that they were counting on the stuff not being open, not being empty, not being inspected. It's it's going to go in the same sealed metal box that it was that was closed at your door in America and brought to your door in Israel. So since they packed it only at that level, yet they're legally obliged to empty it out, then that what happens is that at the port, especially at Ashdod, the stuff gets covered in uh, diesel dust from the 
whatever those things are called, those things that lift, move the pallets around. And they also, there's like water dripping from the ceilings and stuff like that. So, and also there's a much greater chance of theft and loss by stuff being empty out of the port. So it's one thing to have your, an LCL that's created like this, or that's palletized with this thick wrapping around it and have that emptied out because we, we're expecting that. But it's another thing to have somebody give you a deal where they're taking a whole container, and, uh, like a container's worth of stuff, a 1,000 or 800 or whatever it is, cubic feet, and packing it as if it's going to be fully protected in an exclusive container, but it's instead it's going to be dumped out of the port. So that's one of the caveat emptors, uh, buyer bewares. If you get two cheap rates, it... That, that may be their secret that they're combining you with other shipments and some of the guys some of our noble competitors and how do we know this because they hired us to do clearing and delivery for them like just like remember i told you like i'm not allowed to hitchhike you know so we're not allowed to hitchhike other people either so this guy said oh you deliver the container but first go to this parking lot and dump out this stuff because it's for someone else and the guy whose container it is doesn't know that we added stuff to his container you know so we got so this shipper got free shipping for some of his customers anyway that's a no-no uh from many points of view but uh whatever uh that's so you want to avoid getting really cheap right another like cheap that's not cheap uh deal is if somebody offers you marine insurance that's called total loss um, total loss means that you, it's like the lotto, it's like the lottery. It means like if the whole shipment goes into the water and disappears or lights on fire or whatever, then you get the total insured value of the shipment. And if not, if it's not catastrophic total loss, you get zero. And some of our very distinguished competitors who are even members of FIDI, which is like a super fancy uh, shipping organization, they sell total loss insurance for one and a half percent, which means, uh, as I say, maybe I'll revise this someday, but up until now, the way I've talked about it is that their self-interest has too far outstripped their interest in in serving you as a customer if they're selling total loss as a serious option and our our policy our total our all risk policy which is like the real deal uh it sells for not a whole lot more than one and a half percent with a 500 hundred dollar deductible so oh sorry apologize so you so you those are those are two uh red flags of too good to be true uh, shipping insurance that's like one and a half percent and it's called total loss or sending a bunch of stuff like over 600 cubic feet as part of a consolidation that's just being tricky and unfair okay so the the fair options the real options the 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 worthwhile options for shipping insurance are either to do what's called lump sum or a valued inventory. Valued inventory is fairly work intensive, uh, it, which in, what that means is supposedly you're supposed to list everything in your shipment and you're supposed to get replacement values in Israel of everything that you're shipping. So that's no small feat, both to remember everything you have and to come up with appropriate replacement values. And if you value it too high, then you're wasting money. If you value it too low, then you're improperly insured. So that's a bit of a challenge. If you really want to spend the least possible amount of money, so you could choose the items in your shipment that you really care about insuring and insure those appropriately and kind of bundle together the other stuff as mm, if it's all similarly valued. Like if you have 500 books and they're all $15, you can insure those as a, as a lump thing. And you can insure other things grouped together. So that's if you wanted to spend the least possible amount. Don't go with uh, total loss because that's a complete waste of money. And uh, but the but the more the best alternative is something called lump sum, which has only been around for like seven years or so. Which is that the shipment is valued at a minimum, and you can decide the minimum at a minimum of twelve pounds. You you can decide to insure for more. There's like a ton of artwork, and 
$12 a pound. And then because that ends up with quite a high insured value, then the, we're able to give you a 25% discounted rate. So if you're paying whatever it is, 2.5% um, for this, for a $500 deductible. So for this, it's like 2%. So it's a cheaper rate and a higher insured value. And also it's work, it doesn't, it's, it's not terribly work intensive, meaning all you have to list is items that are valued, uh, replacement value above $3,000. And those are insured separately with a, with a separate listing in the same policy. So it both keeps you from, it gives you the discounted rate. It gives you uh, probably as much as you'll ever need for insurance. It insures everything above uh, up to $3,000. Um, dollars without having to list them and insures thing above three thousand dollars simply by listing them so that's a, that's a better deal and here I'm making the distinction between all risk which insures for damage and law damage and theft as well as loss uh, as opposed to total loss which is just catastrophic loss and the, there's a trick also if some people sometimes let's say most packing let me see if I can find the right slide I can't I'll just talk through it like if let's say you want to do some of your own packing because even though our contract covers uh what's called full packing which most of our contracts do and uh, let's say you want to pack your own clothes because you want them organized in a certain way you want to pack your own books because they're so what you can do is leave those boxes open and our guys without additional charge will seal them and will do a sort of inspection and seal them repack as necessary seal them and list them as carrier packed allow to be cured for damage uh, as well as loss and theft so that's a good way to get everything insured so otherwise they're called pbo's packed by owners which can only be insured for uh loss and theft and only up to three hundred dollars a box and only if you know and on, you know et cetera et cetera on like conditions and conditions so that's a way to get all risk insurance for for stuff that you pack yourself. In general, since it's written here, I'll mention we do have from time to time, including this guy who packed all these um, uh, plumbing supplies that he should be taxed for, and they didn't charge him taxes. So the trick, the the difficult part of aside from the physical work of packing your own stuff and not being able to insure it for the damage. Uh, the difficult part is making stuff that looks like professional documentation. Because in order to have customs not uh, harass you, it has to look like it's a professional package. So if a professional shipment, so you get something that we can, we can supply you with something that looks like a professional packing list and you have to fill it in. And, um, and if you do that, then it's like in a reduced likelihood of inspection. But if, if these things are any indication, they're just trying to be super nice to Olim. So who knows? Maybe they're, and the, and the, and that's historically what they've been also. Uh, like we had the guy who brought in, I think he's a, he was a piano restorer. So he brought in like 12 pianos. I, I, I'm not quite sure how many he, de he declared, but it wasn't 12. And instead of like sending him to jail, you know, they wouldn't send him to jail, but instead of like penalizing him or something, they simply asked him, said, you need to get a business license and you need to pay taxes on the extra, you know, at a low value. And they were like super nice to him, even though he'd like misrepresented what was in his shipment. So it maybe that's an indication that um, they're trying to be nice, but they don't like, remember, they didn't like the guy who de who de insisted and declared his little shipment $5,000. They thought that was too weird. So they you know they they ended up paying a few hundred dollars for an inspection anyways so timing so these lcls less than full containers which can be one of those boxes or five or ten whatever the number of those uh things that are created or or packed palletized and wrapped they first go to the our warehouse in america wherever we have agents all around and then they're put into one of these big containers i'm not going to switch around because i'm not going to find my way back i already did um <laughs> They're put, they're put into a um, uh, whatever. I'll, they're put into a into a big container, and and then the guy, our agent, is not going to ship it out until let's say he's going to use a larger container, until he has probably eighty or ninety percent of the thing full, so we can maximize his use of the container, 
and then it's shipped out. So that could take a few weeks, especially in the off season, like winter time. Now we're heading into the real season where uh, people are, are going to be moving more and more. So if you wait for June and July, it's uh, it won't take any time to fight a consolidation. And but it's harder to get bookings, you know. So if you're thinking you're going to want to move in June and July or May even or August, it's worthwhile trying to lock it down now because it gets we start around uh, mid June. We start getting emails from our agents saying these are the these are the dates we have left because it gets booked up. So if you're if you're thinking of shipping a container size thing or maybe a container size then it's probably better to try to book it earlier whereas if it's a consolidation then later is fine and we can do things that we people sometimes call up and say i don't know why this happens but it happens not so infrequently they call up and say we have a week to get out of our house and we need our stuff gone and so okay and somehow things manage to happen and we managed to do it but it's always better, of course, if you can plan in advance and make lists, and that way you'll have a better chance of getting accurate estimates. Some of these rush guys, rush customers, it's like, oh, yeah, here are pictures of everything in our house. And then we go to the house, and it was like, mm, not really. Turns out it was like, you know, five times more. Anyways, so earlier planning, earlier planning, earlier contract signing, earlier reserving dates is, um, if you're those kind of people that can organize, is uh, advantageous. Uh, and it's also, again, the, the, since these containers usually go straight from, unless you're in somewhere in Manhattan and you can't bring a container there on a hill in Vermont, uh, so it, usually these things show up at your, at your house. They're locked and sealed, brought to the port. And, uh, and sent out and then hit the port here. Then within a week, they're usually cleared and delivered. So that's very relatively quick and predictable, like five weeks, you know, typically. Uh, whereas a consolidation could easily be two months or more because it's combined with other things over there to get into a big container. And then it's combined, if it's a small shipment at least, it's combined with other things in a truck here to get it delivered. Now there's another kind of shipment, which I didn't even mention up till now, which is what's called a mini shipment. It's this size, it's 35 cubic feet, which is like the size of an American oven in packing and cardboard and wrapping. And if this is for, if you have just a bunch of stuff that you wanna ship over, and and it doesn't require packing so you send it to our agent in new jersey or i think we have it in florida also and uh and they charge like under a thousand dollars and it goes from new jersey it gets customs clearing documents customs clearing on this side delivery but it's only delivery to the to the sidewalk not into the house and they don't do what they usually do with all the all our other shipments which is unpack and remove the debris and everything so it's just one one place to the next but it's cheap i mean relatively because you're not going to usually get away to ship a consolidated shipment for under a couple of thousand dollars and a container is easily going to cost unless you pack it yourself probably over seven thousand dollars so this is a way if you just wanted to ship a bunch of stuff um, like that. There's, uh, okay, storage. Uh, as I said, I sincerely uh, recommend avoiding storing in America because it's, it's more expensive than storing in Israel. And you can store at the port, but there's it's a problem if it's a container because you're paying the container rental and you're paying high storage. Uh, other kinds of storage you can store for six months and it won't be... Uh, prohibitively expensive. Uh, so and what we can also do on this side, let's say your house is not going to be ready, but you want half your stuff delivered. So we can store part of your stuff at, a, at one of our uh, warehouse and where agents warehouses here in Israel. We have like uh, at least 10 all over the country. And, and we get a, a deal where uh, it's like called like monitored access, where because it's monitored, it's not like free access. You just go in and take and put and take and put. You can extend the marine insurance. Like the marine insurance is a real deal. Like it really does cover damage and loss. So it's a pity to throw it away, like put stuff into storage and you don't know whether something's damaged or lost and then take it out six months later and discover that something's damaged or lost. So what you can do is two things. You can 
both try to monitor yourself as you put it into storage and see if there's anything you do a what's called a bingo sheet in any case when something's delivered there's like a bingo sheet where you mark off you know what you've received the numbers and then and also if something looks like it may be damaged you you put that towards the front of the storage unit but then if the if the key is not with you if it's with our agent there then we can extend the marine insurance for a modest price like a tenth of the normal of the basic price uh each month and then you're covered so you don't have to worry about having caught every damage and loss before it's uh, uh or as it's gone into storage so that's another trick similar to the one about leaving your self-packed goods uh unsealed so you just allow us to put it into monitored access storage. Okay, uh, let's see. We talked about marine insurance. We talked about cheap quotes. Uh, this is a joke from the New Yorker that we paid for many years ago. Uh, so uh, let's see. Okay, we talked about bringing in uh, vehicles, appliances. We talked about professional packing. We talked about why uh, FCLs are quicker than LCLs and more predictable. Custom screening, we try to uh, get uh, documents from you as soon as we possibly can. Even as like the minute you sign with us, we ask for some of your American documents so we can get it out of uh, America without a problem. And then as soon as you get whatever, it depends on your status, whether you have to go to customs. Uh, usually these days for Olim, it's all done by Nefesh Benefesh. And so you don't have to go anywhere. Um, but once in a while, uh, the customs computer fails to, you know, it's like they push save, but it doesn't save. So sometimes you do still have to go to customs. It's pretty rare. Um, and it's even rarer that you have to go, I mean, like almost never, um, to uh, customs to help clear a shipment. And we do that all uh, remotely with our agent. Uh, delivery, the, as I said, normal delivery includes unwrapping all the used furniture. Uh, our delivery people are so terribly accommodating that we had a customer who said recently, and it was kind of weird because we didn't expect that to happen. They said, well, we have, we have a lot of new furniture and we paid you a lot of money and we want that stuff unwrapped and assembled also. And I said, well, you know, it's like excluded in your contract. Like it's like pretty clear. And they're like, we don't care. We wanted to assemble. And our truckers like, okay. So they just assembled everything and took everything out of the, even the new stuff. And like, they got a good tip. They didn't, you know, they didn't seem to mind. So um, our truckers do not stand on ceremony. They pretty much do what you want. Uh, I'm not going to take that as a model. I, you know, I was really surprised when that happened. And, uh, but it's our, it's our, the new breed of truckers. Usually our contract includes uh, just reassembling simple used furniture like table or chairs, uh, not t chairs, but table and beds that were disassembled at origin. But uh, apparently if you, um, if you don't get on the wrong side of the delivery people, they'll do whatever you want. So anyways, we talked about surprises. Uh, the current situation, uh, I guess uh, Bill Gates said we're finished with uh, Corona, but he's something else is coming down the pike. I hope, certainly hope not, or you know whatever. Um, so with Corona, some some sailings were canceled, uh, and the customers had to pay a few hundred dollars sometimes just to leave their stuff in the trucks until we could get an, another sailing because the whole crew got Corona. There have been situations uh, pretty rare, like w one once it happened on an import shipment and although it's happened more than once on our shipments that we leaving Israel where like they couldn't find drivers like there's this tremendous dearth of drivers in America and in Northern Europe um, I, we, the theory is that all the drivers who who until then had lived lonely lives on the road discovered that, that spending time with their families wasn't so bad and and that and the and those uh, monetary incentives for I don't know what the incentive was for I guess to spend the money um, sort of dissuaded people from being truckers anymore. So there's this tremendous shortage of truckers. Anyways, it hasn't happened so much on shipments leaving America only once. But uh, if you ever leave Israel, it's you know, 
and the situation hasn't changed. Anyways, um, but by that time we'll have those uh, who's developing uh, autonomous autonomous uh, truck drivers, truck trucks, somebody. Okay. Also, surprises and uh, storage at origin, very young. All these are like uncommon, but not unheard of. Uh, and I don't even know what they mean. Like, we asked one, we asked, like, what's a port imbalance fee? And, like, anyways, we try on some, on one of these, uh, one of these shipments, like, we called up and said, like, what's a port? It's like, we don't know. Like, it's, you know, it's like somehow got grandfathered in from our whatever i don't know anyways but if if that ever happens to you and uh we can certainly research it for you and make sure that it's real or if you god forbid i shouldn't say that but if you decide to ship with somebody else and they charge any of these strange sounding charges i would ask for third party verification that it's a real charge because what some of our one of our competitors like he would add these uh, even like all the time you know, and we were like, if it's all the time, then why isn't it part of your standard, you know, line items? Like your, in other words, why isn't it included in your one, you know, your general door-to-door -door charge? It's like, whatever. We didn't ask him that, but we thought to ask him that. The other thing about like our competitors, I'm not going to say too many bad things. I haven't named them, so I guess it's not the shunner on any case. But another thing is like we're happy to help compare prices. Like, what does that mean? Like, if you get a contract from someone else and it's cheaper or whatever, and you want us to read through the contract and see if it really is cheaper, uh, we're happy to do that. Because some, we think we found situations where like there's like two lines one after the other in the contract. And if you read them as one sentence, it has one meaning. And if you read them as two fragments, which, which is completely acceptable, it has a completely different meaning and ends up with a different price. So. You have to be wary. Uh, there are uh, people who live up to the bad reputations of businessmen, uh, and there are others that don't live up to live up to the good reputations, businessmen. Anyways, so here is Yael. She's our uh, very uh, pleasant and delightful and well-informed uh, young um, uh, head of sales, and uh, she. These are toll-free numbers, and her extension is one hundred five. And she always has, if she's on the line, it always goes to a message. She calls people back. And this is her email. If you have a question for me specifically, my email is neil at kef. And Daniel, if you have a specific customs related question, Daniel is, uh, is that person. A marine insurance question. Anyways, all the other questions, there are there individuals you could ask, but you could always just ask Yael and she'll, She'll get the answer for you as well. And let's see if any other questions. Uh, so I guess that's it. So uh, um, so I even made some jokes. This is so you were especially privileged. I don't know how clear I was about anything, but I appreciate your patience and look forward to hearing from you guys. So if you have any questions, and we'll send you afterwards. I noticed recently that our link to seeing a webinar uh, is le leading led to a page that like doesn't have any webinar on it. So hopefully I'll fix that today or sometime. I'm getting worse and worse at uh, fixing things on the website. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tamara. And and uh, otherwise we'll uh there's um you can go to youtube and just search for kef international shipping and we have web web webinars on that and we'll hopefully i'll get to repair that other one today and great so baruch haba if you make aliyah and if you have other questions uh, where i as i mentioned maybe i we're going to start doing podcasts like interviewing olim and uh, helping them to define strategies for prospering and doing interesting things here. And so if you have any subjects or people that you'd like to see interviewed, you know, or if you know any video editors, please let us know. Okay. Let me get this one second. And so, okay. Thanks so much and stay safe and healthy and, uh, and happy. Okay. Take care.